to the amazing conversation we're about to have today. My name is Dr. Kathy Lee Arquino, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor of Global Engagement here at UNCP. I've had the honor to get to know and watch grow into this mature young woman, I'm one of my favorite international students from one of the universities that I used to work at in the past. And she's here today to share with us not only about her culture and her heritage, but also what she has done to get to where she is and share very useful cultural information as well as leadership information. So let's get this started. I'd like to introduce al -Hali. So al -Hali, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Kathleen. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure anytime I get to talk about Paraguay. Um, so very excited to be part of this series and, and excited to tell people about Paraguay and my story. Great. So let's just start this off. Um, not everyone gets to know everything about you in the way that I do, and I would love more people to know about how awesome you are. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and um, also how you made it to the United States, what you've studied and what you're doing now? Sure thing. So um, I'm originally from Asuncion, Paraguay, which is the capital of, of Paraguay. Um, and I moved to the United States 10 years ago in 2010. I was uh, playing piano professionally in Paraguay and was a very, very... Uh, lucky uh, to get a scholarship to come to Kansas, all places, um, to pursue a performance degree for, for piano. And uh, through that scholarship, um, I was able to later add on a uh, minor in international business. And I, I fell in love with leadership and international business and all of that. So after I, I finished my degree, um, I still performed and played, uh, but I decided to pursue a master's in technology with, with emphasis in HR, organizational development. So um, then when I was in the first year of my grad school program for HR, I got the chance uh, to do an internship for Bimbo Bakeries USA, um, which is the largest baking company in the world. We're in 33 different countries. So People might not know the name, but they know our brands. Thomas Bagels, Sara Lee Bread, or a Weed. Uh, we dominate the bread industry. <laughs> so they gave me a chance, and I've been working with them for the last five years. Um, in these five years, I've worked in three different states. I've had four different positions. So it's, it's really exciting uh, for the opportunity for growth and um, everything that, that they've allowed me to do. So I'm currently the HR manager for sales and I cover um, El Paso, Nevada, and New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota. Wow, that's such a lot that you have underneath your portfolio. It's a lot, so yes. During but... these times, um, so um, keep up the great work because I know that there's a lot that re of responsibility that goes underneath that region and also the type of work that you do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. from Paraguay, I don't think a lot of people may know where Paraguay is or actually know much about your home country. So do you mind telling us a little bit about the demographics, the location, also the different cultures that exist inside of your country? Absolutely. So that's why I have my little flag over here so you can see it. That's what our flag looks like. Um, but Paraguay, it's, it's kind of a new country, a new upcoming country, because um, it's right in the middle of Brazil and Argentina. So if you think all the way south, um, we are the landlocked country right in the middle. Um, we got Chile to our left, Brazil to our right, Argentina at the bottom and Bolivia on the top. Um, it's a country that's the size of the state of California. The whole country is, is that size. And we are 7 million people, roughly. Um, a new democracy, um, the latest uh, dictatorship ended in 89, if you can think about that, right? Um, and just very warm and nice people, a very young uh, population. So the, the largest percentage of our population is between that 25 to 40 um, age. And uh, 
different cultures. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Paraguay is that we all look different colors and, and we speak different languages. Um, there's a high influence of um, international people there too. Asuncion is very metropolitan. Um, and, and we have two languages, which is something that not a lot of people know. Um, we have a Spanish is our official language, so I do speak Spanish. And then Guarani, which is an Aboriginal language that we still keep alive after all these years. So when we go to school, uh, K twelve, K to to twelfth grade, you learn Spanish, and then you have class for Guarani. So by the time you graduate, you're you're able to at least understand because um, fifty percent of the population speaks speak it. So you need it, right? Um, in, in a very fun country to be from. I, I really enjoy being from there and, and visiting every time I get to go and interacting with, with people, telling them about Paraguay. The food's great, that's for sure. So, <laughs> Yes, I know that firsthand. I was so lucky to be able to experience a lot of the Paraguayan cooking. Um, I like yeah. how you mentioned about how Paraguayans is such a warm, nice, and loving culture. And I feel that with all of the Paraguayan students that I've had the uh, been able and lucky enough to be able to have in my life. I've always felt that and experienced that. And I know that that comes from family and upbringing and also just the culture, as you said, that's there. So um, in talking about that, can you talk a little bit about family values and also tie in um, some of your earliest childhood memories? Absolutely. Um, so as a Hispanic culture, we come from big families, right? It's not... Um, unheard of to have multi-generational homes. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is uh, we're very communal. You know how when, when we talk about the U.S. in comparison to other cultures or European cultures, you know, the, the orientation, it's really in the family for, for us. Um, lots of those strong values. And that also comes from the history of the country. Um, the, the Jesuits were there evangelizing and converting the, the indigenous for a long time. So 93% of, of the population is Catholic. So that gives you an idea as well of, of where we sit, right? Um, and I would say I have to go back to my, my mom is from a family of eight and my dad from three uh, siblings. So that's considered a small family in Paraguay. <laughs> So I would say um, one of my favorite memories, um, well, I would say two. One of them is uh, and on Sundays where we would gather and, and have barbecue, and carne asada, and, and hang out and play guitar and just chit chat the afternoon away, right? You'll go by noon to grandma's house and you'll be there all the way till 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and then my second favorite memory is uh, per se, are the soccer games. Oh, my goodness. Soccer is the second religion of Paraguay. So, <laughs> I went to soccer games and uh, with my dad and with my siblings and uh, being able to have that uh, nice rivalry in the family of what team you, you follow, you know. So, that was really fun uh, growing up, for sure. And you spoke a bit about your mother and father's families, but can you talk a little bit about more of your relationship with your siblings um, and also expand on some of those other cultural and family memories that you had together with your siblings? Absolutely. So I am actually 17 years apart from my youngest sister. So if you think about that, it's kind of crazy. So um, <laughs> I'm, 20, I'm 28 and then the sister in the middle is uh, 21, and then the sister all the way at the bottom is 11. So it's quite interesting for a lot of people, actually, that, that you know, we're three uh, girls and, you know, the youngest is 11. And uh, the reason, I think one of the main reasons for, for those big gaps is that you grow up with your cousins. So your cousins are kind of your siblings to, to that perspective, right? Um, so there, there's a lot of that, again, a cultural thing that, that you might not see everywhere. Um, another big difference is people don't move away. If they move, they move to the next neighborhood <laughs> or the next street. You know, they all stay really, really close. Um, 
So as as we talk about, you know, you you wanted to know more about my transition. I mean, when I when I told them I was moving to the states, you know, it was a big shock. It was like, what are you living? Where are you going? You're leaving your family, right? Um, but I never felt that for my parents. My parents always wanted the best for me. So yeah, we're we're three siblings, mom and dad, um, and so we're considered an, an average family nowadays. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the fun games that uh, may be um, may have held a lot of um, positive memories in your mind? Um, also, because uh, children here sometimes will be playing Duck the Goose or Ring Around the Rosie. So just to kind of see if there's some similar uh, childhood games that also American kids may experience here versus what you played growing up. Yeah, absolutely. The funny thing is that the games don't change much. Um, and, and like tag, for example, we used okay. to call it okay. Tuka which is playing uh, hide and seek, but the literal uh, word in uh, Warani. And I was like, what? Okay, <laughs> that's the same game, but different name. Um, the one where, where, where the kids count the number and then they turn around and they have to freeze. Um, we call that un, dos, tres, miro. And, and it's like, and that's how we play it. And it's again the same game, just a different, uh, a different uh, name. Um, the other one that I remember a lot was uh, we used to play robbers and cop a lot. Which now that I think about, it's interesting that we used to. Play. <laughs> right. So there was like one one team that was the robbers and one team that was the cops. Um, and and we play a lot of again sports, just like mm -hmm. volleyball and soccer all day long. Mm -hmm. That was that was the thing to do. And if we didn't have balls, we would make it make them out of uh, our socks or out of paper, um, and just you know get them all together until we got something mm -hmm. that looked like a ball. So those were some of the games that um, they might have a different name, but they were mm -hmm. essentially the same. And um, I'm sure that some of our listeners aren't quite familiar with Paraguayan food um, and then also um, the love and preparation that goes into preparing this food and then the joy that is sitting around with family and friends eating the food and it's a big event. Um, so do you mind talking to us a bit about the types of different food, but then also what that's like in the home preparing that and what you're doing it for to bring everyone together? Absolutely. Um, so in order to understand Paraguayan food, you got to understand that it's mainly an agricultural country. And uh, there are two main sources of, of economic growth are agriculture and cattle. So meat is a big beef is a big part of, of the culture, right? Because we are uh, the third largest producer of soy in the world. And then corn is it's very high up there, and then beef we export it to everybody. So um, it's very traditional that uh, you know we prepare it, and and then we cook it for three hours. And the funny mm -hmm. thing is, if you go to Paraguay, you'll find out there is no gas uh, grills. Well. Maybe now there are some, but they're very high end. Uh, but the average household will cook their their beef on uh, charcoal. And so if you think about that, the whole process of cooking it on charcoal takes two to three hours because it's, you know, you're, you're calculating your right. right. So that's when all the extra preparation happens. And uh, we're very heavy on corn uh, dishes. Uh, so we, there's a chipawasu, which is basically a corn casserole and the Sopa Paraguaya, which is Paraguayan soup, but it's solid. I know I'm confusing you, but it's, yeah. it's just the way it is. It's like cornmeal bread, basically. And uh, so those are staples that go with beef. Um, and my husband likes to joke that we don't eat veggies, but it's kind of true. Normally, there would be a salad. <laughs> Nobody touches it. Um <laughs> and, and then separate from those big meals. So when you think of Paraguay, you also think of empanadas. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't had an empanada yet, and they are basically meat pockets, 
um, there's there's the meat inside, and then there's a dough cover that you either deep fry or put in the oven uh, to cook, right? And so if we think of empanadas, I would say empanadas are to Paraguay what tacos are to Mexico. Like you find them in every corner. Um, they're the perfect snack at any given moment of the day. Um, and then the the last famous one and, and absolutely delicious, but not least, is uh, lomito. Mm-hmm. So when you go to Paraguay, uh, normally uh, you will be introduced to lomito, but it's basically a, a beef sandwich, but the beef is so thin um, and it's everything you love about a, a beef sa- sandwich. It's like a hamburger, but with a very thin layer of, of actual um, uh, beef, right? And it has fried eggs if you want to, and lettuce, tomato, and ham and cheese, and I'm just salivating talking about it. Um, but it's so good, and it's like the street food that you go get uh, at, at night, normally at night. Um, man, I think I think those are my highlights, Catalina. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because when um, Mirasol and I, my daughter, were in Paraguay last year, um, that was one of my favorite foods that we ate at, um, in the morning, um, at late, early in the morning because we were out um, having fun and it was just so delicious. So you've actually made me super hungry <laughs> to have that again right now. Um, so in um, preparing food or also just in how you grew up with your family, you know, you're talking about large families. Can you talk a little bit about the gender roles and different dynamics that exist in raising kids or expectations um, that exist um, or are in place for fathers and mothers, cousins, aunts and uncles? Talk to a little bit about those family values and dynamics. Absolutely. So um, traditionally, Paraguay is quite conservative in terms of uh, gender roles are quite defined and uh, and stipulated early on. Um, as, as you would expect, you know, the women expected to stay at home and take care of, of the kids, take care of the house, and the men goes to work. Now, I will tell you that with the past of years, I have seen um, a, a different switch where that's not the case so much anymore as when I was growing up. Um, I think just, that's just with times and generation, it changes a bit. But yes, when I was growing up, you know, on Sundays when we were hanging out, the women will be upstairs by the living room and the kitchen, and the men will be downstairs or outside um, with with the grill. Um, and and so if if you wanted to cross that, it was like, this is not your place. This is the guy's place. <laughs> so I actually have a very vivid memory of, of one of the, I think the first or second time that I returned to the U.S. and uh, from, to Paraguay from, from the U.S. And I actually went and sit down with the boys and my aunts and my mom was like, is she mad at us? Why is she sitting over there? And I was like, no, I'm not mad. I, I want to watch the game and I want to talk with my dad. I mean, it's not- <laughs> <laughs> Nothing different, but it was just interesting that it was a norm that I didn't realize until I left that that the girls need to stay upstairs and the guys need to stay outside. Um, and additionally, I just I just saw a lot of particular positions that were designed for for women and for men as I was growing up in school and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you wanted to go to certain careers, uh, you know, it was expected of you to to be a woman or to be a man, depending on what you wanted to do. Uh, but again, I, I have to, I, I have to congratulate my, my parents because uh, in our household, you know, we, we felt some of those pressures uh, as, as women, because we're three women. Uh, but my mom always worked. My mom always worked. Um, and my dad always worked. So it, that I grew up with watching them both have professional careers. Uh, so in my eyes, I could have a professional career as well. Mm-hmm. Now, when you get home, uh, my dad would sit down and enjoy the game or watch the news. And my mom was trying to figure out how to delegate so so we would get things done, right? That is something, mm-hmm. again, that I didn't realize until um, I you know, now I'm married to an American, right? And so some things 
that I did not expect uh, him to take care of the dishes and take care of his laundry, right? But he's independent and I'm independent. So it's it's funny to watch that where where I wouldn't see it in, in other couples. Um, mm -hmm. But I do believe that's, it depends also of, of your upbringing, right? What, what values in the family were there? But culturally speaking, bigger picture, um, it's it's still progressing a little, but it's it's quite conservative. Um, it's an interesting comment that you made about um, times are changing as they are everywhere, but also some of the gender roles that you've seen change and have different definitions as it's becoming more progressive and also in the influences of globalization. Do you mind yeah. talking a little bit more about since you've been living here in the United States for a while and um, now that you go back and forth to Paraguay, what are some of those big things that you've noticed um, that are different in regards to gender based roles and also just in general, how that is impact you think the culture and then also other people trying to reach some of their dreams. Yes. Uh, so it's funny because you grow up with it, so you don't realize that until you leave and then you mm -hmm. come back, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But some of the things that call my attention is where growing up, for example, my, my grandma would do all the cooking, right? And so I never... I never saw a man cooking until like at, at some point where I started going to my older grandma's house where actually my grandpa cooked. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, wait a second, why is he cooking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that was one of the things, but um, when uh, my dad wanted to cook, for example, he was in one household, he was kicked out of the kitchen. He was not mm -hmm. allowed. Because that was, he's a man, he should be outside. And it was just interesting to watch that. What, why? What, if he wants to learn how to cook, let him, right? So that was one of the things that, that called my attention. Um, another one that is interesting is just that the power dynamics in, ster um, in terms of, of leadership positions. So my mom is a very successful uh, lawyer in military justice in Paraguay, but she is one out of seven judges in the military system. Um, and, and if you meet my mom, well, you met my mom, you wouldn't guess that it's just because she's very introvert and soft-spoken, but does not mean that she's not a very assertive and proficient in her, her work. But I, I have to watch her um, get ahead in her professional career, playing her cards very smart, you know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I always say somebody with, with my wits and big mouth might have a, a harder time, you know, <laughs> getting things <Right>. done. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to watch the, those power dynamics there. Um, and, and the, the third thing I think is, it's an observation I just made, um, mm -hmm. is when you, when you go to Paraguay, you're, and, and maybe in other uh, third world countries or, or uh, developing countries, you're able to see this, um, but it, it calls my attention how there is uh, people living in literally, you know, sheds in the streets mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you look at them or you observe their situation, They've got the nicest phone in their hands, or the or they got a dish satellite coming out of the ship. Yeah. And you're like, mm -hmm. wait a second, what are how are the priorities, right? Mm -hmm. And so, those are just some things that I, I I picked up. But again, I don't think they're just in Paraguay. I think it's it's a broader mm -hmm. cultural thing. Um, mm -hmm. But those are some things that I've I've observed uh, for sure, and. Um, I guess if 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 we want to talk about you know, uh, it, from a structural standpoint of of the system, the economical system, you can also see that we're a very young country in terms of of uh, democracy, right? We, we're still figuring out how to run a country uh, um, where everybody has a say, because still nobody has, mm -hmm. like, not everybody has a say. It's mm -hmm. it's typical mm -hmm. that if you have money, you have a say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. or, or you're from a wealthy family. So um, that is something else that, that I've, I've 
picked up on and um, mm -hmm. that I don't know if I didn't move to, to Kansas and, and met um, other peers, I would be able to have the same opportunities that, you know, that I got and mm -hmm. that I have today. Mm -hmm. Um, those are all very interesting um, observations and knowledge that you have with that. I was also curious if you could help explain, are there some other challenges that you feel that Paraguayans face in addition to the ones that you had brought up? Well, we have a very, like, if you really want to hear a messed up story, read the story of Paraguay. <laughs> I mean, we come from war after war after war. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. the fact that we're standing today, is a, it's pretty much a miracle. Um, because the, the biggest one was, uh, the triple alliance war, where three countries fought against us. And then we became this tiny landlocked country. So from an economics perspective, that will always be a challenge because we're landlocked. So if we ever want to grow, um, through export or imports, it's going to be more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. But what I've seen Paraguay do in the last five years, which has been amazing, is uh, take that technology leap and focus on services. Mm -hmm. And so now we find industries in Paraguay that we might have not even thought of uh, five to 10 years ago, just with the mm -hmm. use of internet. And uh, um, we have a, a hydroelectric plant that's right in the corner um, well, shared with, with Brazil, but mm -hmm. that hydroelectric plant, Itaipu, generates 92% of the electricity we use. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's clean energy because it's generated through water. Um, so if you think about that, it's, it's one of, you know, those great things that we're figuring out how to use, how to explode, mm -hmm. um, and how to make that leap to, um, bring new services and new technology to Paraguay. Um, mm -hmm. Last time I was there, for example, uh, I saw tons of fintech companies and uh, co-working spaces, which wow. was something I, I didn't think of before, right, mm -hmm. when I thought mm -hmm. of Paraguay. But uh, they're competing the same way they would be competing in a country here. Um, mm -hmm. Some other challenges, of course, but uh, they're still up and coming on everything they're doing, and especially now with COVID um, mm -hmm. measures they've taken. Have been um, paying off for for how again how small the country is and mm -hmm. and what they need. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. There are so many um, levels and uh, different <laughs> aspects that have helped to shape you and um, different struggles, um, but also successes that um, Paraguayans have gone through to make it this far. It sounds like. Um, so with that, and also um, having experience and living here in the United States, I was wondering, what do you feel are some of the important lessons that you learned about a leaders, leadership, and creating change from Paraguay, but also how that has impacted and influenced what you've seen here in the United States? I mean, there are many. <laughs> and there, there is a reason I, I you know, fought so hard to to leave here, because it, cause I, it's a, it was a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say there are, there are two things I, I love about the American culture. One of them is the predisposition to service that you see, maybe if you're American, you don't, you don't, you don't realize it, but it's from the get go, you get that, that feeling of, of vol like volunteer opportunities and, mm -hmm. uh, giving back which not everybody gets. And again, if you mm -hmm. compare, right, when you're a developing country, um, most people are worried about what they're going to eat tomorrow than mm -hmm. giving back, right? But here mm -hmm. I've seen that it doesn't matter if you have or if you don't, people still donate food banks, um, still mm -hmm. do volunteer work at church or um, mm -hmm. just in the community, recycle centers all over. You know, there are... Mm -hmm. People give back. That's that's what I see. And the the other thing I, I really value and, and I like is that I really believe that in the United States, if if you work hard and if you play your cards right, um, everybody has a chance, you know, and, and especially with, with the recent um 
awakenings that we've had in 2020 with George Floyd and, and everything that's happened, um, it's only going to get better because it's only helping us to see and to realize that uh, even if we thought we had opportunities for everybody, there is more room to, mm -hmm. to grow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do believe like in the concept of the American dream of, of if, if you work hard and if you do things right, um, you can build a life for yourself uh, wherever you are at. And um, that's not to say there's no poverty in the United States because there is and it's very real. Uh, but the resources that exist and, and the support that, that I've seen in the community have been a huge part of, of my, my story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, coming to Pittsburgh with, with two suitcases at 17 years old and broken English and getting all the way to where I'm at today would not have happened without those church free dinners, <laughs> without those those activities and, and those contacts that I made and, and the people saying, hey, Salvation Army or Goodwill mm -hmm. to, to get some secondhand stuff mm -hmm. until I was a professional and I could afford those things for myself. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things I, I value the most about the United States. And um, what are some of the things that you've taken from Paraguay as you've been growing up um, learning about leaders and leadership? Um, what are some of those things that you are really important to you and value that you continue to carry on and have a part of who you are? Realize that in leadership, hey, you lead the way, but you lead it by acting and you lead it by caring. So, uh, People don't care about what you say until they know you care. That 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 has been something that stuck with me. And that is something that I bring from Paraguay. Like <laughs> because in Paraguay, everybody sometimes to their fault, right? To an extreme, but they care. They care about you, they care about how you're doing. Um, you would see that no meeting starts without a wrap up of how the weekend went. Or, mm -hmm. or how the family's doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I realized that sometimes, in, especially sometimes in corporate America, we're, we're so focused on numbers and um, you know results driven that we might forget, forget that these are people, real people dealing with trying to work from home with four kids and having to homeschool and not, not being able to leave the house and parks being closed, you know? <laughs> it's, Mm -hmm. It's real people going through real struggles, right? And uh, that will always be something I, I cherish from, from my country and my upbringing that I think adds a lot of value to my business and the way I run um, my, my team because mm -hmm. it's, it's about caring and it's about coaching my, my leaders to, to mm -hmm. put the people first. The numbers will follow, but it, once you put the safety of your associates and and you know, trading them fairly, you're doing the right thing. That's such a strong and powerful statement. A lot of leaders could really take that to heart and really do some great change in having that philosophy too. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, since we were talking about things that you noticed from growing up and how that's impacted you, things that you noticed in the United States, um, what are some of the big differences that you see between Paraguay and the United States? Mm, big differences. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I would I would say uh, first of all the size of it, <laughs> because in Paraguay um, some people would travel, but most of the population have never put their feet on a on a plane. Uh, we travel by bus mm -hmm. because the country is small. You can do it, right? <laughs> um, the access to um, infrastructure, so uh, public transportation, and the, I mean, the the highway system that the United States have, it's amazing, and you can really, you know, get on your car and drive anywhere, and you'll be fine, right? Mm -hmm. We are still developing that in Paraguay. It's not quite there yet. Uh, so Paraguay is, for example, divided in in, in two regions: the the occidental region, which is the Chaco, the desert. Mm -hmm. And the and the Oriental uh, region, which is more developed in terms of agriculture and all the cities, really where all the cities are. 
So to get from Asuncion all the way to the top of Paraguay, to the Chaco, mm -hmm. it takes nine hours. And you basically have to drive all the way west and so down southwest and mm -hmm. then go up. Like in the mm -hmm. in the frontier with Brazil, you go up. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just interesting to to see those things in terms of infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. Education is it's relatively similar, but our our school days are are smaller, and, and here mm -hmm. the school days are larger and have more activities. Um, and we eat a oh, okay food. We eat a lot of organic food in Paraguay. So like when you go to a supermarket, your veggies don't all look perfect, <laughs> but they're, but they're much more like they, they have more flavor. So that was interesting, like to, to come here and go to shop. And it was like, wait a second, they all look pretty. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, and, and I, I guess for, for me, just the biggest difference over there is just a, the size of the country really mm -hmm. makes it be a cohesive country there are different mini cultures happening like the mennonites are in paraguay um mm -hmm. you know they, we have the indigenous uh in an area we also have the brassy Wyans, the people that live in the frontier and speak portuguese and you're like what um, mm -hmm. so there's those micro cultures but it, here in the United States is so big that it's uh, typical that people won't leave the country because they just go to a different state and they get a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I guess those are my my big differences that I find. And the biggest question I wanted to ask you is that how would you say that living in the United States has influenced you and your ideas and your outlook on careers, your family, friendships, cultures, et cetera? Everything. <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I have to say that um, the first time I did an exchange program, and this was through the U.S. Embassy, um, I was 15 years old and um, I came to the States. And then I went back to Paraguay and I told my parents, um, I'm going to go to college in the U.S. Well, back then I was 15 and they say, sure, sure, sure. But didn't give much thought to it. But when I was 17, I did it. And uh I guess my mom supported me all the way through, but my dad still didn't take it seriously until he he's had to sign paperwork for me to move to to the United States. And he was like, "Are you really doing this?" And I was like, yeah, "I told you, I've been telling you." <laughs> so I think the biggest uh, change happened when I was able to see something different, um, mm -hmm. and this is why I've always been an advocate for travel and studied abroad and 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 doing things because when you're able to see a different country or a different space and and you are free from a, your family or mm -hmm. or your friends you go on your own you're able to formulate different ideas and and different thought processes and it's not the same to go for a family vacation to Belize than mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. study abroad to Belize by yourself and have to live there. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's just different, right? You're able to formulate different ideas and to process what you're feeling because on a vacation, you're mm -hmm. having a vacation. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first impact is to broaden the horizons, um, mm -hmm. to, to keep seeing different things. Um, and the funny thing that happens now is that now that I've lived in the States for a while, every time I go back home, I get that experience that I used to get backwards, right? Because I'm able to see what they are doing. How are they developing, engaging, and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, growing, even though all the corruption and uncertainty and, and everything that goes down over there. Mm -hmm. um it's it's interesting to see that and i also got a chance to uh, 
spent a couple months in Taiwan mm -hmm. um, through a scholarship from the university and lived there. And again, it was the same feeling. It's just, it, it forces your mind to get used to something different. So then you can grow and learn. And there's always mm -hmm. going to be pluses and minuses, right? Mm -hmm. But you're able to filter what you want to bring back and, and give to your team and, and what kind of person you want to be after you mm -hmm. see those experiences. And if you'd never go see them, you might read about them. You might mm -hmm. uh, watch shows about it. But uh, until you go see it, it really something happens um, and, and it broadens your horizons. Well, Ahali, I am so, so, so proud of you. Uh, it has been my honor to be a part of your life and everything that you have done, all that you've gone through. I just think you're so strong and amazing and I love you so very much. I'm so thankful that you agreed for me to interview today because so many people are not only going to learn about Paraguay and different cultural differences, but also maybe entice them to visit. Um, but most importantly, I think that your story is quite inspirational. So thank you for your time today to be able to share it with everybody. Of course, and it's my pleasure. So um, thank you, and I hope more people travel after all of this is done and just a plea to stay safe out there and, and take care of each other. Well, thank you very much. And thank you listeners for being a part of this today. Um, we look forward to having more interviews and learning about other parts of the world. Bye-bye.